move a little bit into the chemistry now. Actually, uh, yeah. I did want to pass around uh, a phytoplankton cell, a really large one. This is what phytoplankton <laughs> look like when you blow it up by a million plus times. Um, one of my students made this. I'd love to know how she did it, but uh, take a look. That's what a diatom looks like. And were you able to peer into the lives of the oil in your car? That's what you would see. All right, let's talk about Annie being Kinos and Guy favorite subject, chemistry. Oil has some chemistry to it. And the crude oil that comes out and that I'm going to pass around right here in these little jars. I'm going to leave it in the plastic bag. You can take it out if you want. Uh, but if you've ever experienced crude oil before, what happens? It's sticky. And I'm not going to let you use my Dawn. So this is not crude oil from the Gulf. Um, Rick was supposed to go get me some, but he wasn't able to do that this summer. I couldn't find it because it was all leaking. That's why. Crude oil is really a mixture of a lot of different kinds of molecules. And I'll use the word a lot of different. The chemists might use it, uh, others. Uh, and we'll talk about that. But a mixture of molecules called hydrocarbons. And we're not going to get too much into the chemistry of it. But it's important to understand that crude oil is a mix of a lot of different things. And in the most, uh, in, this, in the sort of technical sense, crude oil is one component of petroleum and gas, natural gas is the other component. Uh, petroleum usually refers to both crude oil and natural gas. And as we learned from the kids in that video, they basically come, crude oil comes from very and heated phytoplankton. I don't really think I need to show this slide, but the Bentley you drive, the water bottles you drink, the snowboards you use, snowboard on, the pens you write with, the backpacks you carry, the flip-flops you wear to the beach, and the football that our number two nationally ranked football team uses. <laughs> but you didn't know we had a number two ranked football team at Fullerton College, do you? But we do. Uh, made out of petroleum. So we could not have a football team if it wasn't for petroleum. <laughs> All right, and probably most of us wouldn't be here. Anyway, but I want to talk about this one group of uh, hydrocarbons called alkanes. I don't know where alkane got their name, but it's, you can ask the chemist about that. They're straight carbon hydrocarbons, and they're made out of, oddly enough, and, and in a rare show of appreciation for people to understand something, they didn't name it some weird name that you couldn't understand, but they're made out of hydrogen, that's a hydro part, and carbon, thus hydrocarbon. <laughs> they could have named it Schlugaba. And we would have all had to learn that word in our chemistry class, but thankfully. And the thing that distinguishes the alkanes, uh, they're the simplest of the hydrocarbons, um, because they're the only ones I remember from my organic chemistry class in 1974. Uh, and they're straight chain, and they're easy to name. They're named according to the number of carbons. So here we have seven carbons, that's heptane. Here we have 14 carbons. Tetradecane. Here we have motor oil that has, I don't even remember, 27 carbons in a chain, otherwise known as heptacosane. And those of you in chemistry will be needing to learn this. And then we have plastic. It's lots of cane. It's got lots of carbons and lots of hydrogens. And I wasn't going to. And it's insane. Yeah, all chemistry is insane. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do right now, or have some of you do in the next portion of my talk, and uh, again, I didn't know we were going to have like hundreds of people here, but one thing you can do at home if you have some toothpicks and some marshmallows is you can make a very simple hydrocarbon <laughs> molecule. If we let a big white marshmallow stand for which molecule? Carbon, because it's big. And if we let a little colored molecule stand for the hydrogen, because it's small, we can create the simplest hydrocarbon. And I'm going to just fake the bond angles here as best that I can. So excuse me, Dr. Chadwick. Uh, what's the simplest hydrocarbon with one carbon atom and three hydrogens? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make sure they were paying attention. Four. Try to sneak it out. CH4. 
<laughs> These bond angles aren't correct. <laughs> What's it called? <laughs> methane. Anybody ever smelled methane before? Yeah. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> And you can go on and on, and the people in the front row can spend the rest of their time doing this as we want. But, but alkanes are simply strung together marshmallows. And one of the things that I want you to think about, again, petroleum being this mixture, and as we get on to talking a little bit more about the biology especially, and even the physics of oil, it's those smaller molecules that are evaporated most quickly it's those smaller molecules as you are handing, as you're tossing around that, uh, the crude there, that you'll smell. But it's the really big ones, it's the lots of decanes uh, that you will actually, that stay behind. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes as well. Uh, so we were going to do this exercise, it would be a great exercise to ask your chemistry teacher to do, or even your biology teacher if you're studying petroleum, you can just get this table. I probably got this one off of Wikipedia. Uh, methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nine, and decane. Uh, sort of like the elements guy, so he needs to do a song about that. Um, and make your own edible molecular marshmallows. So the best way to study chemistry is with a bag of marshmallows. <laughs> now, if you were going to eat your marshmallows, your marshmallow molecules, which one do you think you could eat the fastest? Probably the simplest one, the methane. Just don't swallow the toothpicks or find edible toothpicks if they make such a thing. <laughs> and, and we want to keep that in mind, so remember that. All right. Different hydrocarbons, as I've already said, this, the lighter hydrocarbons will evaporate quickly. Some of them will dissolve into water. The heavier ones will <laughs> stick behind. And what does this look like? These are the. This is sort of after it's the crude oil's been weathered a little bit. What does this stuff look like? Oh, I don't know. It must mean save the person that comes to your head, because that's probably what everyone's thinking. And no, no idea what that looks like. Chocolate pudding, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Diarrhea? I don't you know. <laughs> anyway, I have here, not in a plastic bag, but in a jar, and I'll start at this side, some tar balls. That Dr. Lozinski and I collected from a beach in Louisiana. Uh, that's a lie, but. <laughs> Anybody ever seen tar balls before? Yeah, our local beaches have tar balls all the time. Do they come from oil spills? You don't know. Was that too hard of a question? She went, oh. <laughs> Oil comes from the ground, and in some cases, when the cap rock, you remember how deep the deep water horizon well is? I showed you that image. If that rock is like hard cement, the oil can't get through it. But if it's sandstone or rocks that get cracked from earthquakes, that oil will, and natural gas, will move its way to the top. And we have places off of our coast where Methane is seeping through. You can see it bubbling through the seafloor, and even the natural, uh, the the crude oil is coming up. And it's not a lot. It's not at the rate of 52,000 barrels a day, but we do get it on our beaches as well. And the uh, NOAA website that uh, has a, a great um, information pamphlet on tar balls. This is one of the tar balls I collected in a. Somewhere, I don't know where exactly it was, but it's really, they're, they're no fun. And when you get them on your feet, you got to come home. And what's the best way to get them off? Yeah. Gasoline, usually, or turpentine or something like that. People use Dawn, but it's, that's a slow way to go. Or just cut off your foot. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that we do to combat oil spills, and a little bit more chemistry here, is to add something called dispersants. And dispersants are a kind of molecule that lead a double life in some sense. Part of the molecule loves water. Oil, what is oil normally? What did you say about the oil-water relationship? If oil and water were to enter a room, what would you guess would happen to them? They, would they wouldn't like each other. I don't like you. They would just stay away from each other because oil repels water or floats on water. Well, dispersants and another group of molecules you find in your favorite dishwashing liquid, surfactants, are a kind of molecule that has an end that likes water and that has an end that likes oil. 
and it brings them together. Dispersants might be thought of the, as the ambassador between oil and water. Uh, I don't think they have peace talks, but they don't need to. And here we have some oil and water, and you can see they don't like each other. They're really, even if you were up close, you could hear them yelling at each other. <laughs> this is a edible oil, otherwise known as olive oil, and I picked the extra virgin only because, I don't know, they tell me on websites that extra virgin olive oil tastes better. Who knew? You add a little dispersant, and you can try this at home. I didn't want to open up real oil. And what happens? Voila, it worked. It's my, oh, the one thing I did forget, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to wear safety glasses when you do experiments. <laughs> the oil and water are all mixed up. The dispersant disperses the oil. And when Tony Hayward, the CEO of BP, saw this demonstration, he said, I gotta have some of that stuff. <laughs> and so what they did is made a decision to disperse as much of that damn oil as they could. Just disperse it. Because this looks much nicer than black oil floating on waves coming in. And if the public can't see it, then what? It can't hurt. And they're not going to play. They're not going to complain about it. And it can't hurt. So what they did then, I already did the demonstration, was applied buttloads of dispersant, <coughs> known as Corexit, and it has some particular number. It's a particular dispersant developed by, uh, I think it's Dow, as a matter of fact, that developed Corexit, which is a dispersant. And I just began applying it. And we get to hear this song again. <laughs> so enamored they were with dispersant as they actually ran an ROV with a pipe down to the brake, and you can see this a little bit later on now in the spill. That this is a blowout preventer I talked about. And they had an ROV with a chainsaw on it, really just a steel saw that cut this off. And you can see this white stuff coming out in here, and you can see how it changes color, just like our little demonstration here. They applied 9.6 million bottles of Dawn <laughs> to the oil spill. What happens to that dispersed oil besides disappearing? And what are the ecological and human effects of dispersed oil? As we'll see in just a moment, the answer should worry you. <laughs>